I think there are two examples which show, uh, I can think of many examples, uh, which show how to die well. One is Socrates, who is condemned to death unjustly by the Athenian democracy, um, and he's forced to swallow the hemlock. But there's no rage in Socrates. He, know, he could have escaped. He chooses not to escape. He swallows the hemlock. He is thinking all the time of other people. He washes his body to save the women the trouble. He jokes kindly with his jailer. He doesn't rail against him. And he sits and accepts the loving companionship with his friends as he drinks the, head, the hemlock. He, there's no rage. There's a, a big accepting kindness. And that was not just because Socrates got a blast from God at the end, but because his whole life had been about facing the unknown, preparing for this moment, sitting loose to life and ego, and lis emptying himself compassionately in dialogue with other people. In a Socratic dialogue, the kind of conversations he had with other people, nobody won the argument. Everybody realized uh, that they knew nothing at all um, and that they listened and it always had to be conducted throughout with gentleness. There must be no anger or malice. And that endless discipline throughout his life enabled him to face this unjust death. And the other one is Jesus, who on the cross in the depths of agony is presented by uh, the gospel writers as having time to have a kindly word for one of his fellow victims, uh, to make provision for his mother and forgive his executioners. Um, but again, we don't know much about Jesus' disciplines, but he had lived a compassionate life. Uh, it won't just come at the end. Uh, I've uh, just seen my mother through her last years, and a lot of... Um, of the distress that she'd experienced in her life came to the fore in the end, things that she hadn't really dealt with. We ha now is the time to prepare for death. The, a lot of the religions say that life is a preparation for death, which sounds morbid, but uh, extinction, something we find very, very difficult to cope with, the idea that we're not going to be here anymore and that we've got to go through, as the Buddha always said, sickness, old age and an undignified death. He himself suffered a, a, a death of dysentery in some jungle miles from his friend and died saying, comforting his, comforting his followers, saying, don't worry about me. Uh, you have, have got in yourself the means to go on, thinking of them. And I'll tell you one personal story, if you like, uh, of somebody who was dying um, and who made an Im immense impact on me and has made, has remained an icon with me. When I was a young nun, um, we were trained quite abrasively. Uh, people who've read my story always think it reminds them of boot camp in the army. And you don't expect your sergeant major to be full of compassion towards you. Uh, he's supposed to be training you to face fire and to be tough. But I had one superior who was kind. Uh, and she'd had a grim life. At the age of 29, she'd gone deaf and had was, had a very good mind, but she'd spent all the intervening years, I think something like 40, 30, 40 years, uh, sewing, mending sheets uh, in, 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 in the laundry. Uh, you'd think a waste of a life and anybody else could have become rageful and bitter. But she didn't. And at the end of her life, she was dying all the year when she was training me. Uh, she was dying of cancer. She, when I arrived in, in her community, she'd been given three weeks to live. But she lasted the whole year and she refused to take any painkillers because she said they would make her head muzzy. And uh, she was dealing with young people and had to be alert for them. Now, you couldn't put her on a pedestal because she was really quite eccentric in many ways, had many kind of quirky eccentricities. Uh, she was used to get furious if we broke things. And as a result, we were all so nervous. I've never broken so many things in the whole course of my life. But I was beginning to realize that I was going to have to go. 
and my body was telling me uh, already. I was starting vomiting, sickness, nosebleeds, all psychosomatic symptoms uh, that I was going to have to leave the convent. But she was always so kind. Then came the day when they were going to take her away to the mother house to die, and she was in bed, very full of pain, skin and bones. We all went in, us young nuns, to say goodbye to her. And she smiled rather like Socrates and joked with us um, and said she'd be looking down from us on heaven and, you know, she'd be dead soon and all the rest of it. Sent us out and she asked me to come back. And I went and knelt by the bed. And she said, Sister, I always, I was told that you would be a troublesome uh, young woman. I want to tell you, you have never been a trouble to me. You've been a good girl, sister. And re always remember I told you so. You are a good girl. And then she put her hand on my, on my head and blessed me and I went out. Now, for someone in an extreme of agony to take notice to, uh, no doubt, a rather annoying young woman, a uh, troubled young woman, in that moment of extremity, I've never forgotten that. Uh, but that's... She had trained herself through all those difficult years it, not to become bitter, not to think, why me, why my deafness, why am I wasting my life? And as a result, she's remained in me as an icon of what a good person should be.